Volume Two, Part Two, Author's Preface. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume Two, Part Two, Author's Preface by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby. 1829 to 1895 dedication of part two to the count of lemos these days past when sending your excellency my plays that had appeared in print before being shown on the stage i said if i remember well that don quixote was putting on his spurs to go and render homage to your excellency now i say that with his spurs he is on his way should he reach destination methinks i shall have rendered some service to your excellency as from many parts i am urged to send him off so as to dispel the loathing and disgust caused by another don quixote who under the name of second part has run masquerading through the whole world and he who has shown the greatest longing for him has been the great emperor of china who wrote me a letter in chinese a month ago and sent it by a special courier he asked me or to be truthful he begged me to send him don quixote for he intended to found a college where the spanish tongue would be taught and it was his wish that the book to be read should be the history of don quixote he also added that i should go and be the rector of this college i asked the bearer if his majesty had afforded a sum in aid of my travel expenses he answered no not even in thought then brother i replied you can return to your china post haste or at whatever haste you are bound to go as i am not fit for so long a travel and besides being ill i am very much without money while emperor for emperor and monarch for monarch i have at naples the great count of lemos who without so many petty titles of colleges and rectorships sustains me protects me and does me more favour than i can wish for thus i gave him his leave and i beg mine from you offering your excellency the trabajos de persiles y sigismunda a book i shall finish within four months deo volente and which will be either the worst or the best that has been composed in our language i mean of those intended for entertainment at which i repent of having called it the worst for in the opinion of friends it is bound to attain the summit of possible quality may your excellency return in such health that is wished you persiles will be ready to kiss your hand and i your feet being as i am your excellency's most humble servant from madrid this last day of october of the year one thousand six hundred and fifteen at the service of your excellency miguel de cervantes saavedra the author's preface god bless me gentle or it may be plebeian reader how eagerly must thou be looking forward to this preface expecting to find their retaliation scolding and abuse against the author of the second don quixote i mean him who was they say begotten at tordesillas and born at tarragona well then the truth is i am not going to give thee that satisfaction for though injuries stir up anger in humbler breasts in mine the rule must admit of an exception thou wouldst have me call him ass fool and malapert but i have no such intention let his offence be his punishment with his bread let him eat it and there's an end of it what i cannot help taking amiss is that he charges me with being old and one-handed as if it had been in my power to keep time from passing over me or as if the loss of my hand had been brought about in some tavern and not on the grandest occasion the past or present has seen or the future can hope to see if my wounds have no beauty to the beholder's eye they are at least honourable in the estimation of those who know where they were received for the soldier shows to greater advantage dead in battle than alive in flight and so strongly is this my feeling that if now it were proposed to perform an impossibility for me i would rather have had my share in that mighty action than be free from my wounds this minute without having been present at it those the soldier shows on his face and breast are stars that direct others to the heaven of honour and ambition of merited praise and moreover it is to be observed that it is not with grey hairs that one writes but with the understanding and that commonly improves with years i take it amiss too that he calls me envious 
and explains to me as if i were ignorant what envy is for really and truly of the two kinds there are i only know that which is holy noble and high-minded and if that be so as it is i am not likely to attack a priest above all if in addition he holds the rank of familiar of the holy office and if he said what he did on account of him on whose behalf it seems he spoke he is entirely mistaken for i worship the genius of that person and admire his works and his unceasing and strenuous industry after all i am grateful to this gentleman the author for saying that my novels are more satirical than exemplary but that they are good for they could not be that unless there was a little of everything in them i suspect thou wilt say that i am taking a very humble line and keeping myself too much within the bounds of my moderation from a feeling that additional suffering should not be inflicted upon a sufferer and that what this gentleman has to endure must doubtless be very great as he does not dare to come out into the open field in broad daylight but hides his name and disguises his country as if he had been guilty of some les majesty if perchance thou shouldst come to know him tell him from me that i do not hold myself aggrieved for i know well what the temptations of the devil are and that one of the greatest is putting it into a man's head that he can write and print a book by which he will get as much fame as money and as much money as fame and to prove it i will beg of you in your own sprightly pleasant way to tell him this story there was a madman in seville who took to one of the drollest absurdities and vagaries that ever madman in the world gave way to it was this he made a tube of reed sharp at one end and catching a dog in the street or wherever it might be he with his foot held one of its legs fast and with his hand lifted up the other and as best he could fixed the tube whereby blowing he made the dog as round as a ball then holding it in his position he gave it a couple of slaps on the belly and let it go saying to the bystanders and there were always plenty of them do your worships think now that it is an easy thing to blow up a dog does your worship think now that it is an easy thing to write a book and if this story does not suit him you may dear reader tell him this one which is likewise of a madman and a dog in cordova there was another madman whose way it was to carry a piece of marble slab or a stone not of the lightest on his head and when he came upon any unwary dog he used to draw close to him and let the weight fall right on top of him on which the dog in a rage barking and howling would run three streets without stopping it so happened however that one of the dogs he discharged his load upon was a cap maker's dog of which his master was very fond the stone came down hitting it on the head the dog raised a yell at the blow the master saw the affair and was wroth and snatching up a measuring yard rushed out at the madman and did not leave a sound bone in his body and at every stroke he gave him he said you dog you thief my lurcher don't you see my brute that my dog is a lurcher and so repeating the word lurcher again and again he sent the madman away beaten to a jelly the madman took the lesson to heart and vanished and for more than a month never once showed himself in public but after that he came out again with his old trick and a heavier load than ever he came up to where there was a dog and examining it very carefully without venturing to let the stone fall he said this is a lurcher where in short all the dogs he came across be they mastiffs or terriers he said were lurchers and he discharged no more stones maybe it will be the same with this historian that he will not venture another time to discharge the weight of his wit in books which being bad are harder than stones tell him too that i do not care a farthing for the threat he holds out to me of depriving me of my profit by means of his book for to borrow from the famous interlude of the perendenga i say in answer to him long life to my lord the vain ticatro and christ be with us all long life to the great conde de lemos whose christian charity and well-known generosity support me against all the strokes of my cursed fortune and long life to the supreme benevolence of his eminence of toledo don bernardo de sandoval y rojas and what matter if there be no printing presses in the world or if they print more books against me than there are letters in the verses a mingle revulgo these two princes unsought by any adulation or flattery of mine of their own goodness alone 
have taken it upon them to show me kindness and protect me and in this i consider myself happier and richer than if fortune had raised me to her greatest height in the ordinary way the poor man may retain honour but not the vicious poverty may cast a cloud over nobility but cannot hide it altogether and as virtue of itself sheds a certain light even though it be through the straits and chinks of penury it wins the esteem of lofty and noble spirits and in consequence their protection thou needst say no more to him nor will i say anything more to thee save to tell thee to bear in mind that this second part of don quixote which i offer thee is cut by the same craftsman and from the same cloth as the first and that in it i present to thee don quixote continued and at length dead and buried so that no one may dare to bring forward any further evidence against him for that already produced is sufficient and suffice it too that some reputable person should have given an account of all these shrewd lunacies of his without going into the matter again for abundance even of good things prevents them from being valued and scarcity even in the case of what is bad confers a certain value i was forgetting to tell thee that thou mayest expect the persiles which i am now finishing and also the second part of galatea end of author's preface Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 1 Of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha By Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra Translated by John Ormsby, 1829-1895 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine volume two part two chapter one of the interview the curate and the barber had with don quixote about his malady cid hamet benengeli in the second part of this history and third sally of don quixote says that the curate and the barber remained nearly a month without seeing him lest they should recall or bring back to his recollection what had taken place they did not however omit to visit his niece and housekeeper and charged them to be careful to treat him with attention and give him comforting things to eat and such as were good for the heart and the brain whence it was plain to see all his misfortune proceeded the niece and housekeeper replied that they did so and meant to do so with all possible care and assiduity for they could perceive that their master was now and then beginning to show signs of being in his right mind this gave great satisfaction to the curate and the barber for they concluded they had taken the right course in carrying him off enchanted on the ox-cart as has been described in the first part of this great as well as accurate history in the last chapter thereof so they resolved to pay him a visit and test the improvement in his condition although they thought it almost impossible that there could be any and they agreed not to touch upon any point connected with knight-errantry so as not to run the risk of reopening wounds which were still so tender they came to see him consequently and found him sitting up in bed in a green baize waistcoat and a red toledo cap and so withered and dried up that he looked as if he had been turned into a mummy they were very cordially received by him they asked him after his health and he talked to them about himself very naturally and in very well-chosen language in the course of their conversation they fell to discussing what they call statecraft and systems of government correcting this abuse and condemning that reforming one practice and abolishing another each of the three setting up for a new legislator a modern lycurgus or a brand new solon and so completely did they remodel the state that they seemed to have thrust it into a furnace and taken out something quite different from what they had put in and on all the subjects they dealt with don quixote spoke with such good sense that the pair of examiners were fully convinced that he was quite recovered and in his full senses the niece and housekeeper were present at the conversation and could not find words enough to express their thanks to god at seeing their master so clear in his mind the curate however changing his original plan which was to avoid touching upon matters of chivalry resolved to test don quixote's recovery thoroughly and see whether it were genuine or not and so from one subject to another he came at last to talk of the news that had come from the capital and among other things he said it was considered certain that the turk was coming down with a powerful fleet 
and that no one knew what his purpose was or when the great storm would burst and that all christendom was in apprehension of this which almost every year calls us to arms and that his majesty had made provision for the security of the coasts of naples and sicily and the island of malta to this don quixote replied his majesty has acted like a prudent warrior in providing for the safety of his realms in time so that the enemy may not find him unprepared but if my advice were taken i would recommend him to adopt a measure which at present no doubt his majesty is very far from thinking of the moment the curate heard this he said to himself god keep thee in his hand poor don quixote for it seems to me thou art precipitating thyself from the height of thy madness into the profound abyss of thy simplicity but the barber who had the same suspicion as the curate asked don quixote what would be his advice as to the measures that he said ought to be adopted for perhaps it might prove to be one that would have to be added to the list of the many impertinent suggestions that people were in the habit of offering to princes mine master shaver said don quixote will not be impertinent but on the contrary pertinent i don't mean that said the barber but that experience has shown that all or most of the expedients which are proposed to his majesty are either impossible or absurd or injurious to the king and to the kingdom mine however replied don quixote is neither impossible nor absurd but the easiest the most reasonable the readiest and most expeditious that could suggest itself to any projector's mind you take a long time to tell it senor don quixote said the curate i don't choose to tell it here now said don quixote and have it reach the ears of the lords of the council to-morrow morning and some other carry off their thanks and rewards of my trouble for my part said the barber i give my word here and before god that i will not repeat what your worship says to king rook or earthly man an oath i learned from the ballad of the curate who in the prelude told the king of the thief who had robbed him of the hundred gold crowns in his pacing mule i am not versed in stories said don quixote but i know the oath is a good one because i know the barber to be an honest fellow even if he were not said the curate i will go bail and answer for him that in this matter he will be as silent as a dummy under pain of paying any penalty that may be pronounced and who will be security for you senor curate said don quixote my profession replied the curate which is to keep secrets odds body said don quixote at this what more has his majesty to do but to command by public proclamation all the knights errant that are scattered over spain to assemble on a fixed day in the capital for even if no more than half a dozen come there may be one among them who alone will suffice to destroy the entire might of the turk give me your attention and follow me is it pray any new thing for a single knight errant to demolish an army of two hundred thousand men as if they all had but one throat or were made of sugar paste nay tell me how many histories are there filled with these marvels if only in an evil hour for me i don't speak for any one else the famous don belianis were alive now or any one of the innumerable progeny of amadis of gaul if any of these were alive to-day and were to come face to face with the turk by my faith i would not give much for the turk's chance but god will have regard for his people and will provide some one who if not so valiant as the knights errant of yore at least will not be inferior to them in spirit but god knows what i mean and i say no more alas exclaimed the niece at this may i die if my master does not want to turn knight-errant again to which don quixote replied a knight-errant i shall die and let the turk come down or go up when he likes and in as strong force as he can once more i say god knows what i mean but here the barber said i ask your worships to give me leave to tell a short story of something that happened in seville which comes so pat to the purpose just now that i should like greatly to tell it don quixote gave him leave and the rest prepared to listen and he began thus in the madhouse at seville there was a man whom his relations had placed there as being out of his mind he was a graduate of osuna in canon law but even if he had been of salamanca it was the opinion of most people that he would have been mad all the same this graduate after some years of confinement took it into his head that he was sane and in his full senses and under this impression wrote to the archbishop entreating him earnestly and in very correct language to have him released from the misery in which he was living 
for by god's mercy he had now recovered his lost reason though his relations in order to enjoy his property kept him there and in spite of the truth would make him out to be mad until his dying day the archbishop moved by repeated sensible well-written letters directed one of his chaplains to make inquiry of the madhouse as to the truth of the licentiate statements and to have an interview with the madman himself and if it should appear that he was in his senses to take him out and restore him to liberty the chaplain did so and the governor assured him that the man was still mad and that though he often spoke like a highly intelligent person he would in the end break out into nonsense that in quantity and quality counterbalanced all the sensible things he had said before as might be easily tested by talking to him the chaplain resolved to try the experiment and obtaining access to the madman conversed with him for an hour or more during the whole of which time he never uttered a word that was incoherent or absurd but on the contrary spoke so rationally that the chaplain was compelled to believe him to be sane among other things he said the governor was against him not to lose the presents his relations made him for reporting him still mad but with lucid intervals and that the worst foe he had in his misfortune was his large property for in order to enjoy it his enemies disparaged and threw doubts upon the mercy our lord had shown him in turning him from a brute beast into a man in short he spoke in such a way that he cast suspicion on the governor and made his relations appear covetous and heartless and himself so rational that the chaplain determined to take him away with him that the archbishop might see him and ascertain for himself the truth of the matter yielding to this conviction the worthy chaplain begged the governor to have the clothes in which the licentiate had entered the house given to him the governor again bade him beware of what he was doing as the licentiate was beyond a doubt still mad but all his cautions and warnings were unavailing to dissuade the chaplain from taking him away the governor seeing that it was the order of the archbishop obeyed and they dressed the licentiate in his own clothes which were new and decent he as soon as he saw himself clothed like one in his senses and divested of the appearance of a madman entreated the chaplain to permit him in charity to go and take leave of his comrades the madman the chaplain said he would go with him to see what madmen there were in the house so they went upstairs and with them some of those who were present approaching a cage in which there was a furious madman though just at that moment calm and quiet the licentiate said to him brother think if you have any commands for me for i am going home as god has been pleased in his infinite goodness and mercy without any merit of mine to restore me my reason i am now cured and in my senses for with god's power nothing is impossible have strong hope and trust in him for as he has restored me to my original condition so likewise he will restore you if you trust in him i will take care to send you some good things to eat and be sure you eat them for i would have you know i am convinced as one who has gone through it that all this madness of ours comes of having the stomach empty and the brains full of wind take courage take courage for despondency and misfortune breaks down health and brings on death to all these words of the licentiate another madman in a cage opposite that of the furious one was listening and raising himself up from an old mat on which he lay stark naked he asked in a loud voice who it was that was going away cured and in his senses the licentiate answered it is i brother who am going i have now no need to remain here any longer for which i return infinite thanks to heaven that has had so great mercy upon me mind what you are saying licentiate don't let the devil deceive you replied the madman keep quiet stay where you are and you will save yourself the trouble of coming back i know i am cured returned the licentiate and that i shall not have to go stations again you cured said the madman well we shall see god be with you but i swear to you by jupiter whose majesty i represent on earth that for this crime alone which seville is committing to-day in releasing you from this house and treating you as if you were in your senses i shall have to inflict such a punishment on it as will be remembered for ages and ages amen dost thou not know thou miserable little licentiate that i can do it being as i say jupiter the thunderer who hold in my hands the fiery bolts with which i am able and am wont to threaten and lay waste the world 
but in one way only will i punish this ignorant town and that is by not raining upon it nor on any part of its district or territory for three whole years to be reckoned from the day and moment when this threat is pronounced thou free thou cured thou in thy senses and i mad i disordered i bound i will as soon think of sending rain as of hanging myself those present stood listening to the words and exclamations of the madman but our licentiate turning to the chaplain and seizing him by the hands said to him be not uneasy senor attach no importance to what this madman has said for if he is jupiter and will not send rain i who am neptune the father and god of the waters will rain as often as it pleases me and may be needful the governor and the bystanders laughed and at their laughter the chaplain was half ashamed and he replied for all that senor neptune it will not do to vex senor jupiter remain where you are and some other day when there is a better opportunity and more time we will come back for you so they stripped the licentiate and he was left where he was and that's the end of the story so that's the story master barber said don quixote which came in so pat to the purpose that you could not help telling it master shaver master shaver how blind is he who cannot see through a sieve is it possible that you do not know the comparisons of wit with wit valour with valour beauty with beauty birth with birth are always odious and unwelcome i master barber am not neptune the god of the waters nor do i try to make any one take me for an astute man for i am not one my only endeavour is to convince the world of the mistake it makes in not reviving in itself the happy time when the order of knight-errantry was in the field but our depraved age does not deserve to enjoy such a blessing as those ages enjoyed when knights-errant took upon their shoulders the defence of kingdoms the protection of damsels the succour of orphans and minors the chastisement of the proud and the recompense of the humble with the knights of these days for the most part it is the damask brocade and rich stuffs they wear that rustle as they go not the chain-mail of their armour no knight nowadays sleeps in the open field exposed to the inclemency of heaven and in full panoply from head to foot no one now takes a nap as they call it without drawing his feet out of the stirrups and leaning upon his lance as the knights errant used to do no one now issuing from the wood penetrates yonder mountains and then treads the barren lonely shore of the sea mostly a tempestuous and stormy one and finding on the beach a little bark without oars sail mast or tackling of any kind in the intrepidity of his heart flings himself into it and commits himself to the wrathful billows of the deep sea that one moment lift him up to heaven and the next plunge him into the depths and opposing his breast to the irresistible gale finds himself when he least expects it three thousand leagues and more away from the place where he embarked and leaping ashore in a remote and unknown land as adventures that deserve to be written not on parchment but on brass but now sloth triumphs over energy indolence over exertion vice over virtue arrogance over courage and theory over practice in arms which flourished and shone only in the golden ages and in knights errant for tell me who was more virtuous and more valiant than the famous amadis of gaul who more discreet than palmerin of england who more gracious and easy than tirante el blanco who more courtly than lisuarte of greece who more slashed or slashing than don belianis who more intrepid than perion of gaul who more ready to face danger than felix marte of hircania who more sincere than esplandion who more impetuous than don cirangilio of thrace who more bold than rodomante who more prudent than king sobrino who more daring than reinaldos who more invincible than roland and who more gallant and courteous than ruggiero from whom the dukes of ferrara of the present day are descended according to turpin in his cosmography all these knights and many more that i could name senor curate were knights errant the light and glory of chivalry these or such as these i would have to carry out my plan and in that case his majesty would find himself well served and would save great expense and the turk would be left tearing his beard and so i will stay where i am as the chaplain does not take me away and if jupiter as the barber has told us will not send rain here am i 
and I will reign when I please. I say this that Master Basin may know that I understand him. Indeed, Señor Don Quixote, said the barber, I did not mean it in that way, and so help me God, my intention was good, and your worship ought not to be vexed. As to whether I ought to be vexed or not, returned Don Quixote, I myself am the best judge. Hereupon the curate observed, I have hardly said a word as yet, and I would gladly be relieved of a doubt arising from what Don Quixote has said that worries and works my conscience. The senior curate has leave for more than that, returned Don Quixote, so he may declare his doubt, for it is not pleasant to have a doubt on one's conscience. Well then, with that permission, said the curate, I say my doubt is that all I can do. I cannot persuade myself that the whole pack of knights errant you senor don quixote have mentioned were really and truly persons of flesh and blood that ever lived in the world on the contrary i suspect it to be all fiction fable and falsehood and dreams told by men awakened from sleep or rather still half asleep that is another mistake replied don quixote into which many have fallen who do not believe that there ever were such knights in the world and i have often with diverse people and on diverse occasions tried to expose this almost universal error to the light of truth. Sometimes I have not been successful in my purpose, sometimes I have, supporting it upon the shoulders of the truth, which truth is so clear that I can almost say I have with my own eyes seen Amadis of Gaul, who was a man of lofty stature, fair complexion, with a handsome though black beard, of a countenance between gentle and stern in expression, sparing of words, slow to anger, and quick to put it away from him and as i have depicted amadis so i could i think portray and describe all the knights errant that are in all the histories in the world for by the perception i have that they were what their histories describe and by the deeds they did and the dispositions they displayed it is possible with the aid of sound philosophy to deduce their features complexion and stature how big in your worship's opinion may the giant morgante have been senor don quixote asked the barber with regard to giants, replied Don Quixote, opinions differ as to whether there ever were any or not in the world. But the Holy Scripture, which cannot err by a jot from the truth, shows us that there were, when it gives us the history of that big Philistine Goliath, who was seven cubits and a half in height, which is a huge size. Likewise, in the island of Sicily, there have been found leg bones and arm bones so large that their size makes it plain that their owners were giants, and as tall as great towers. Geometry puts this fact beyond a doubt. But for all that, I cannot speak with certainty as to the size of Morgante, though I suspect he cannot have been very tall. And I am inclined to be of this opinion, because I find in the history in which his deeds are particularly mentioned, that he frequently slept under a roof, and as he found houses to contain him, it is clear that his bulk could not have been anything excessive. That is true, said the curate and yielding to the enjoyment of hearing such nonsense, he asked him what was his notion of the features of Reynaldos of Montalban, and Don Roland and the rest of the twelve peers of France, for they were all knights errant. As for Reynaldos, replied Don Quixote, I venture to say that he was broad-faced, of ruddy complexion, with roguish and somewhat prominent eyes, excessively punctilious and touchy, and given to the society of thieves and scapegraces with regard to roland or rotolando or orlando for the histories call him by all these names i am of opinion and hold that he was of middle height broad-shouldered rather bow-legged swarthy complexioned red-bearded with a hairy body and a severe expression of countenance a man of few words but very polite and well-bred if roland was not a more graceful person than your worship has described said the curate it is no wonder that the fair lady angelica rejected him and left him for the gaiety liveliness and grace of that budding bearded little moor to whom she surrendered herself and she showed her sense in falling in love with the gentle softness of medoro rather than the roughness of roland that angelica senor curate returned don quixote was a giddy damsel flighty and somewhat wanton and she left the world as full of her vagaries as of the fame of her beauty she treated with scorn a thousand gentlemen men of valour and wisdom and took up with a smooth-faced sprig of a page without fortune or fame except such reputation for gratitude as the affection he bore his friend got for him 
the great poet who sang her beauty the famous ariosto not caring to sing her adventures after her contemptible surrender which probably were not over and above creditable dropped her where he says how she received the sceptre of cathay some bard of defter quill may sing some day and this was no doubt a kind of prophecy for poets are also called vates that is to say diviners and its truth was made plain for since then a famous andalusian poet has lamented and sung her tears and another famous and rare poet a castilian has sung her beauty tell me senor don quixote said the barber here among all those who praised her has there been no poet to write a satire on this lady angelica i can well believe replied don quixote that if sacripante or roland had been poets they would have given the damsel a trimming for it is naturally the way with poets who have been scorned and rejected by their ladies whether fictitious or not in short by those whom they select as the ladies of their thoughts to avenge themselves in satires and libels a vengeance to be sure unworthy of generous hearts but up to the present i have not heard of any defamatory verse against a lady angelica who turned the world upside down strange said the curate but at this moment they heard the housekeeper and the niece who had previously withdrawn from the conversation exclaiming aloud in the courtyard and at the noise they all ran out end of volume two part two chapter one recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter two of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter two which treats of the notable altercation which sancho panza had with don quixote's niece and housekeeper together with other droll matters the history relates that the outcry don quixote the curate and the barber heard came from the niece and the housekeeper exclaiming to sancho who was striving to force his way in to see don quixote while they held the door against him what does the vagabond want in this house be off to your own brother for it is you and no one else that delude my master and lead him astray and take him tramping about the country to which sancho replied devil's own housekeeper it is i who am deluded and led astray and taken tramping about the country and not thy master he has carried me all over the world and you are mightily mistaken he enticed me away from home by a trick promising me an island which i am still waiting for may evil islands choke thee thou detestable sancho said the niece what are islands is it something to eat glutton and gormandizer that thou art it is not something to eat replied sancho but something to govern and rule and better than four cities or four judgeships at court for all that said the housekeeper you don't enter here you bag of mischief and sack of knavery go govern your house and dig your seed patch and give over looking for islands or shylands the curate and the barber listened with great amusement to the words of the three but don quixote uneasy lest sancho should blab and blurt out a whole heap of mischievous stupidities and touch upon points that might not be altogether to his credit called to him and made the other two hold their tongues and let him come in sancho entered and the curate and the barber took their leave of don quixote of whose recovery they despaired when they saw how wedded he was to his crazy ideas and how saturated with the nonsense of his unlucky chivalry and said the curate to the barber you will see gossip that when we are least thinking of it our gentleman will be off once more for another flight i have no doubt of it returned the barber but i do not wonder so much at the madness of the knight as at the simplicity of the squire who has such a firm belief in all that about the island that i suppose all the exposures that could be imagined would not get it out of his head god help them said the curate and let us be on the lookout to see what comes of all these absurdities of the knight and squire for it seems as if they both had been cast in the same mould and the madness of the master without the simplicity of the man would not be worth a farthing that is true said the barber and i should like very much to know what the pair are talking about at this moment i promise you said the curate the niece or the housekeeper will tell us by and by for they are not the ones to forget to listen 
Meanwhile, Don Quixote shut himself up in his room with Sancho, and when they were alone he said to him, It grieves me greatly, Sancho, that thou shouldst have said and sayest that I took thee out of thy cottage, when thou knowest I did not remain in my house. We sallied forth together, we took the road together, we wandered abroad together, we have had the same fortune and the same luck. If they blanketed thee once, they belaboured me a hundred times, and that is the only advantage I have of thee. That was only reasonable, replied Sancho, for by what your worship says, misfortunes belong more properly to knights errant than to their squires. Thou art mistaken, Sancho, said Don Quixote, according to the maxim, quando caput dolet, etc., i don't understand any language but my own said sancho i mean to say said don quixote that when the head suffers all the members suffer and so being thy lord and master i am thy head and thou a part of me as thou art my servant and therefore any evil that affects or shall affect me should give thee pain and what affects thee should give pain to me it should be so said sancho but when i was blanketed as a member my head was on the other side of the wall looking on while i was flying through the air and did not feel any pain whatever and if the members are obliged to feel the suffering of the head it should be obliged to feel their sufferings dost thou mean to say now sancho said don quixote that i did not feel when they were blanketing thee if thou dost thou must not say so or think so for i felt more pain then in spirit than thou didst in body but let us put that aside for the present for we shall have opportunities enough for considering and settling the point tell me sancho my friend what do they say about me in the village here what do the common people think of me what do the hidalgos what do the caballeros what do they say of my valour of my achievements of my courtesy how do they treat the task i have undertaken in reviving and restoring to the world the now forgotten order of chivalry in short sancho i would have thee tell me all that has come to thine ears on this subject and thou art to tell me without adding anything to the good or taking away anything from the bad for it is the duty of loyal vassals to tell the truth to their lords just as it is and in its proper shape not allowing flattery to add to it or any idle deference to lessen it and i would have thee know sancho that if the naked truth undisguised by flattery came to the ears of princes times would be different and other ages would be reckoned iron ages more than ours which i hold to be the golden of these latter days profit by this advice sancho and report to me clearly and faithfully the truth of what thou knowest touching what i have demanded of thee that i will do with all my heart master replied sancho provided your worship will not be vexed at what i say as you wish me to say it out in all its nakedness without putting any more clothes on it than it came to my knowledge in i will not be vexed at all returned don quixote thou mayest speak freely sancho and without any beating about the bush well then said he first of all i have to tell you that the common people consider your worship a mighty great madman and me no less a fool the hidalgos say that not keeping within the bounds of your quality of gentleman you have assumed the don and made a knight of yourself at a jump with four vine stalks and a couple of acres of land and never a shirt to your back the caballeros say that they do not want to have hidalgos setting up in opposition to them particularly squire hidalgos who polish their own shoes and darn their black stockings with green silk that said don quixote does not apply to me for i always go well dressed and never patched ragged i may be but ragged more from the wear and tear of arms than of time as to your worship's valour courtesy accomplishments and task there is a variety of opinions some say mad but droll others valiant but unlucky others courteous but meddling and then they go into such a number of things that they don't leave a whole bone either in your worship or in myself recollect sancho said don quixote that wherever virtue exists in an eminent degree it is persecuted few or none of the famous men that have lived escaped being calumniated by malice julius caesar the boldest wisest and bravest of captains was charged with being ambitious and not particularly cleanly in his dress or pure in his morals of alexander whose deeds won him the name of great they say that he was somewhat of a drunkard of hercules him of the many labours it is said that he was lewd and luxurious 
of don galaor the brother of amadis of gaul it was whispered that he was over quarrelsome and of his brother that he was lachrymose so that o sancho amongst all these calumnies against good men mine may be let pass since they are no more than thou hast said that's just where it is body of my father is there more then asked don quixote there is the tail to be skinned yet said sancho all so far as cakes and fancy bread but if your worship wants to know all about the calumnies they bring against you i will fetch you one this instant who can tell you the whole of them without missing an atom for last night the son of bartholomew carrasco who has been studying at salamanca came home after having been made a bachelor and when i went to welcome him he told me that your worship's history is already abroad in books with the title of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha and he says they mention me in it by my own name of sancho panza and the lady dulcinea del toboso too and divers things that happened to us when we were alone so that i crossed myself in my wonder how the historian who wrote them down could have known them i promise thee sancho said don quixote the author of our history will be some sage enchanter for to such nothing that they choose to write about is hidden what said sancho a sage and an enchanter why the bachelor samson carrasco that is the name of him i spoke of says the author of the history is called cide hamate berengena that is a moorish name said don quixote maybe so replied sancho for i have heard say that the moors are mostly great lovers of berengenas thou must have mistaken the surname of the seed which means in arabic lord sancho observed don quixote very likely replied sancho but if your worship wishes me to fetch the bachelor i will go for him in a twinkling that will do me a great pleasure my friend said don quixote for what thou hast told me has amazed me and i shall not eat a morsel that will agree with me until i have heard all about it then i am off for him said sancho and leaving his master he went in quest of the bachelor with whom he returned in a short time and all three together they had a very droll colloquy end of volume two part two chapter two recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter three of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter three of the laughable conversation that passed between don quixote sancho panza and the bachelor samson carrasco don quixote remained very deep in thought waiting for the bachelor carrasco from whom he was to hear how he himself had been put into a book as sancho said and he could not persuade himself that any such history could be in existence for the blood of the enemies he had slain was not yet dry on the blade of his sword and now they wanted to make out that his mighty achievements were going about in print for all that he fancied some sage either a friend or an enemy might by the aid of magic have given them to the press if a friend in order to magnify and exalt them above the most famous ever achieved by any knight-errant if an enemy to bring them to naught and degrade them below the meanest ever recorded of any low squire though as he said to himself the achievements of squires never were recorded if however it were the fact that such a history were in existence it must necessarily being the story of a knight-errant be grandiloquent lofty imposing grand and true with this he comforted himself somewhat though it made him uncomfortable to think that the author was a moor judging by the title of seed and that no truth was to be looked for from moors as they are all impostors cheats and schemers he was afraid he might have dealt with his love affairs in some indecorous fashion that might tend to the discredit and prejudice of the purity of his lady dulcinea del toboso he would have had him set forth the fidelity and respect he had always observed towards her spurning queens empresses and damsels of all sorts and keeping in check the impetuosity of his natural impulses absorbed and wrapped up in these and divers other cogitations he was found by sancho and carrasco whom don quixote received with great courtesy the bachelor though he was called samson was of no great bodily size but he was a very great wag 
he was of a sallow complexion but very sharp-witted somewhere about four and twenty years of age with a round face a flat nose and a large mouth all indications of a mischievous disposition and a love of fun and jokes and of this he gave a sample as soon as he saw don quixote by falling on his knees before him and saying let me kiss your mightiness's hand senor don quixote of la mancha for by the habit of saint peter that i wear though i have no more than the first four orders your worship is one of the most famous knights errant that have ever been or will be all the world over a blessing on seed hamet benengeli who has written the history of your great deeds and a double blessing on that connoisseur who took the trouble of having it translated out of the arabic into our castilian vulgar tongue for the universal entertainment of the people don quixote made him rise and said so then it is true that there is a history of me and that it was a moor and a sage who wrote it so true is it senor said samson that my belief is there are more than twelve thousand volumes of the said history in print this very day only ask portugal barcelona and valencia where they have been printed and moreover there is a report that it is being printed at antwerp and i am persuaded there will not be a country or language in which there will not be a translation of it one of the things here observed don quixote that ought to give most pleasure to a virtuous and eminent man is to find himself in his lifetime in print and in type familiar in people's mouths with a good name i say with a good name for if it be the opposite then there is no death to be compared to it if it goes by good name and fame said the bachelor your worship alone bears away the poem from all the knights errant for the moor in his own language and the christian in his have taken care to set before us your gallantry your high courage in encountering dangers your fortitude in adversity your patience under misfortunes as well as wounds the purity and continence of the platonic loves of your worship and my lady doña dulcinea del toboso i never heard my lady dulcinea called doña observed sancho here nothing more than the lady dulcinea del toboso so here already the history is wrong that is not an objection of any importance replied carrasco certainly not said don quixote but tell me senor bachelor what deeds of mine are they that are made most of in this history on that point replied the bachelor opinions differ as tastes do some swear by the adventure of the windmills that your worship took to be bria ruses and giants others by that of the fulling mills one cries up the description of the two armies that afterwards took the appearance of two droves of sheep another that of the dead body on its way to be buried at segovia a third says the liberation of the galley slaves is the best of all and a fourth that nothing comes up to the affair with the benedictine giants and the battle with the valiant biscayan tell me senor bachelor said sancho at this point does the adventure with the young gazans come in when our good rocinante went hankering after dainties the sage has left nothing in the ink bottle replied samson he tells all and sets down everything even to the capers that worthy sancho cut in the blanket i cut no capers in the blanket returned sancho in the air i did and more of them than i liked there is no human history in the world i suppose said don quixote that has not its ups and downs but more than others such as deal with chivalry for they can never be entirely made up of prosperous adventures for all that replied the bachelor there are those who have read the history who say they would have been glad if the author had left out some of the countless cudgellings that were inflicted on senor don quixote in various encounters that's where the truth of the history comes in said sancho at the same time they might fairly have passed them over in silence observed don quixote for there is no need of recording events which do not change or affect the truth of a history if they tend to bring the hero of it into contempt aeneas was not in truth and earnest so pious as virgil represents him nor ulysses so wise as homer describes him that is true said samson but it is one thing to write as a poet another to write as a historian the poet may describe or sing things not as they were but as they ought to have been but the historian has to write them down not as they ought to have been but as they were without adding anything to the truth or taking anything from it well then said sancho if this senor moor goes in for telling the truth no doubt among my master's drubbings mine are to be found for they never took the measure of his worship's shoulders without doing the same for my whole body but i have no right to wonder at that for as my master himself says 
the members must share the pain of the head you are a sly dog sancho said don quixote in faith you have no want of memory when you choose to remember if i were to try to forget the thwacks they gave me said sancho my wheels would not let me for they are still fresh on my ribs hush sancho said don quixote and don't interrupt the bachelor whom i entreat to go on and tell all that is said about me in this history and about me said sancho for they say too that i am one of the principal personages in it personages not personages friend sancho said samson what another word-catcher said sancho if that's to be the way we shall not make an end in a lifetime may god shorten mine sancho returned the bachelor if you are not the second person in the history and there are even some who would rather hear you talk than the cleverest in the whole book though there are some too who say you showed yourself over credulous in believing there was any possibility in the government of that island offered you by senor don quixote there is still sunshine on the wall said don quixote and when sancho is somewhat more advanced in life with the experience that years bring he will be fitter and better qualified for being a governor than he is at present by god master said sancho the island that i cannot govern with the years i have i'll not be able to govern with the years of methuselah the difficulty is that the said island keeps its distance somewhere i know not where and not that there is any want of head in me to govern it leave it to god sancho said don quixote for all will be and perhaps better than you think no leaf on the tree stirs but by god's will that is true said samson and if it be god's will there would not be any want of a thousand islands much less one for sancho to govern i have seen governors in these parts said sancho that are not to be compared to my shoe sole and for all that they are called your lordship and served on silver those are not governors of islands observed samson but of other governments of an easier kind those that govern islands must at least know grammar i could manage the gram well enough said sancho but for the more i have neither leaning nor liking for i don't know what it is but leaving this matter of the government in god's hands to send me wherever it may be most to his service i may tell you senor bachelor samson carrasco it has pleased me beyond measure that the author of this history should have spoken of me in such a way that what is said of me gives no offence for on the faith of a true squire if he had said anything about me that was at all unbecoming an old christian such as i am the deaf would have heard of it that would be working miracles said samson miracles or no miracles said sancho let every one mind how he speaks or writes about people and not set down at random the first thing that comes into his head one of the faults they find with this history said the bachelor is that its author inserted in it a novel called the ill-advised curiosity not that it is bad or ill-told but that it is out of place and has nothing to do with the history of his worship senor don quixote i will bet the son of a dog has mixed the cabbages in the basket said sancho then i say said don quixote the author of my history was no sage but some ignorant chatterer who in a haphazard and heedless way set about writing it let it turn out as it might just as orbanieja the painter of ubeda used to do who when they asked him what he was painting answered what it may turn out sometimes he would paint a cock in such a fashion and so unlike that he had to write alongside of it in gothic letters this is a cock and so it will be with my history which will require a commentary to make it intelligible no fear of that returned samson for it is so plain that there is nothing in it to puzzle over the children turn its leaves the young people read it the grown men understand it the old folk praise it in a word it is so thumbed and read and got by heart by people of all sorts that the instant they see any lean hack they say there goes rocinante and those that are most given to reading it are the pages for there is not a lord's antechamber where there is not a don quixote to be found one takes it up if another lays it down this one pounces upon it and that begs for it in short the said history is the most delightful and least injurious entertainment that has been hitherto seen for there is not to be found in the whole of it even the semblance of an immodest word or a thought that is other than catholic to write in any other way said don quixote would not be to write truth but falsehood and historians who have recourse to falsehood ought to be burned like those who coin false money and i know not what could have led the author to have recourse to novels and irrelevant stories when he had so much to write about in mine no doubt 
he must have gone by the proverb with straw or with hay etc for by merely setting forth my thoughts my sighs my tears my lofty purposes my enterprises he might have made a volume as large or larger than all the works of el tostado would make up in fact the conclusion i arrive at senor bachelor is that to write histories or books of any kind there is need of great judgment and a ripe understanding to give expression to humour and write in a strain of graceful pleasantry is the gift of great geniuses the cleverest character in comedy is the clown for he who would make people take him for a fool must not be one history is in a measure a sacred thing for it should be true and where the truth is there god is but notwithstanding this there are some who write and fling books broadcast on the world as if they were fritters there is no book so bad but it has something good in it said the bachelor no doubt of that replied don quixote but it often happens that those who have acquired and attained a well-deserved reputation by their writings lose it entirely or damage it in some degree when they give them to the press the reason of that said samson is that as printed works are examined leisurely their faults are easily seen and the greater the fame of the writer the more closely are they scrutinized men famous for their genius great poets illustrious historians are always or most commonly envied by those who take a particular delight and pleasure in criticising the writings of others without having produced any of their own that is no wonder said don quixote for there are many divines who are no good for the pulpit but excellent in detecting the defects or excesses of those who preach all that is true senor don quixote said carrasco but i wish such fault-finders were more lenient and less exacting and did not pay so much attention to the spots on the bright sun of the work they grumble at for if aliquando bonus dormitat homerus they should remember how long he remained awake to shed the light of his work with as little shade as possible and perhaps it may be that what they find fault with may be moles that sometimes heighten the beauty of the face that bears them and so i say very great is the risk to which he who prints a book exposes himself for of all impossibilities the greatest is to write one that will satisfy and please all readers that which treats of me must have pleased few said don quixote quite the contrary said the bachelor for as stultorum infinitum est numerus innumerable are those who have relished the said history but some have brought a charge against the author's memory inasmuch as he forgot to say who the thief was who stole sancho's dapple for it is not stated there but only to be inferred from what is set down that he was stolen and a little farther on we say sancho mounted on the same ass without any reappearance of it they say too that he forgot to state what sancho did with those hundred crowns that he found in the valise in the sierra morena as he never alludes to them again and there are many who would be glad to know what he did with them or what he spent them on for it is one of the serious omissions of the work senor samson i am not in a humour now for going into accounts or explanations said sancho for there is a sinking of the stomach come over me and unless i doctor it with a couple of sups of the old stuff it will put me on the thorn of santa lucia i have it at home and my old woman is waiting for me after dinner i'll come back and will answer you and all the world every question you may choose to ask as well about the loss of the ass as about the spending of the hundred crowns and without another word or waiting for a reply he made off home don quixote begged and entreated the bachelor to stay and do penance with him the bachelor accepted the invitation and remained a couple of young pigeons were added to the ordinary fare at dinner they talked chivalry carrasco fell in with his host's humour the banquet came to an end they took their afternoon sleep sancho returned and their conversation was resumed end of volume two part two chapter three recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter four of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes saavedra translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter four in which sancho panza 
gives a satisfactory reply to the doubts and questions of the bachelor Samson Carrasco, together with other matters worth knowing and telling. Sancho came back to Don Quixote's house, and returning to the late subject of conversation, he said, as to what Senor Samson said, that he would like to know by whom or how or when my ass was stolen, I say in reply that the same night we went into the Sierra Morena, flying from the Holy Brotherhood after that unlucky adventure of the galley slaves, and the other of the corpse that was going to Segovia, my master and I ensconced ourselves in a thicket, and there, my master leaning on his lance and I seated on my dapple, battered and weary with the late phrase, we fell asleep as if it had been on four feather mattresses and i in particular slept so sound that whoever he was he was able to come and prop me up on four stakes which he put under the four corners of the pack saddle in such a way that he left me mounted on it and took away dapple from under me without my feeling it that is an easy matter said don quixote and it is no new occurrence for the same thing happened to sacripante at the siege of abraca the famous thief, Brunello, by the same contrivance, took his horse from between his legs. Day came, continued Sancho, and the moment I stirred, the stakes gave way, and I fell to the ground with a mighty come-down. I looked about for the ass, but could not see him. The tears rushed to my eyes, and I raised such a lamentation that if the author of our history has not put it in, he may depend upon it he has left out a good thing. Some days after, I know not how many, travelling with her ladyship the princess Mikomikona, I saw my ass, and mounted upon him, in the dress of a gypsy, was that Gines de Pasamonte, the great rogue and rascal that my master and I freed from the chain. That is not where the mistake is, replied Samson. It is that before the ass has turned up, the author speaks of Sancho as being mounted on it. I don't know what to say to that, said Sancho, unless that the historian made a mistake, or perhaps it might be a blunder of the printers. No doubt that's it, said Samson. But what became of the hundred crowns? Did they vanish? To which Sancho answered, I spent them for my own good, and my wife's, and my children's, and it is they that have made my wife bear so patiently all my wanderings on highways and byways in the service of my master Don Quixote. For if after all this time I had come back to the house without a wrap and without the ass, it would have been a poor lookout for me. And if anyone wants to know anything more about me, here I am, ready to answer the king himself in person and it is no affair of any one's whether i took or did not take whether i spent or did not spend for the wax that were given me in these journeys were to be paid for in money even if they were valued at no more than four maravedis apiece another hundred crowns would not pay me for half of them let each look to himself and not try to make out white black and black white for each of us is as god made him ay and often worse i will take care said carrasco to impress upon the author of the history that if he prints it again he must not forget what worthy sancho has said for it will raise it a good span higher is there anything else to correct in the history senor bachelor asked don quixote no doubt there is replied he but not anything that will be of the same importance as those i have mentioned does the author promise a second part at all said don quixote he does promise one replied samson but he says he has not found it nor does he know who has got it and we cannot say whether it will appear or not and so on that head as some say that no second part has ever been good and others that enough has been already written about don quixote it is thought there will be no second part though some who are jovial rather than saturnine say let us have more quixotes let don quixote charge and sancho chatter and no matter what it may turn out we shall be satisfied with that and what does the author mean to do said don quixote what replied samson why as soon as he has found the history which he is now searching for with extraordinary diligence he will at once give it to the press moved more by the profit that may accrue to him from doing so than by any thought of praise whereat sancho observed the author looks for money and profit does he it will be a wonder if he succeeds for it will only be hurry hurry with him like the tailor on easter eve and works done in a hurry are never finished as perfectly as they ought to be let master moore or whatever he is pay attention to what he is doing and i and my master will give him as much grouting ready to his hand in the way of adventures and accidents of all sorts as would make up not only one second part but a hundred the good man fancies no doubt that we are fast asleep in the straw here but let him hold up our feet to be shod and he will see which foot it is we go lame on 
all i say is that if my master would take my advice we would be now afield redressing outrages and righting wrongs as is the use and custom of good knights errant sancho had hardly uttered these words when the neighing of rocinante fell upon their ears which neighing don quixote accepted as a happy omen and he resolved to make another sally in three or four days from that time announcing his intention to the bachelor he asked his advice as to the quarter in which he ought to commence his expedition and the bachelor replied that in his opinion he ought to go to the kingdom of aragon and the city of saragossa where there were to be certain solemn joustings at the festival of st george at which he might win renown above all the knights of aragon which would be winning it above all the knights of the world he commended his very praiseworthy and gallant resolution but admonished him to proceed with greater caution in encountering dangers because his life did not belong to him but to all those who had need of him to protect and aid them in their misfortunes there is where it is what i abominate senor samson said sancho here my master will attack a hundred armed men as a greedy boy would half a dozen melons body of the world senor bachelor there is a time to attack and a time to retreat and it is not to be always santiago and close spain moreover i have heard it said and i think by my master himself if i remember rightly that the mean of valour lies between the extremes of cowardice and rashness and if that be so i don't want him to fly without having good reason or to attack when the odds make it better not but above all things i warn my master that if he is to take me with him it must be on the condition that he is to do all the fighting and that i am not to be called upon to do anything except what concerns keeping him clean and comfortable in this i will dance attendance on him readily but to expect me to draw a sword even against rascally churls of the hatchet and hood is idle i don't set up to be a fighting man senor samson but only the best and most loyal squire that ever served knight-errant and if my master don quixote in consideration of my many faithful services is pleased to give me some island of the many his worship says one may stumble on in these parts i will take it as a great favour and if he does not give it to me i was born like every one else and a man must not live in dependence on any one except god and what is more my bread will taste as well and perhaps even better without a government than if i were a governor and how do i know but that in these governments the devil may have prepared some trip for me to make me lose my footing and fall and knock my grinders out sancho i was born and sancho i mean to die but for all that if heaven were to make me a fair offer of an island or something else of the kind without much trouble and without much risk i am not such a fool as to refuse it for they say too when they offer thee a heifer run with a halter and when good luck comes to thee take it in brother sancho said said carrasco you have spoken like a professor but for all that put your trust in god and in senor don quixote for he will give you a kingdom not to say an island it is all the same be it more or be it less replied sancho though i can tell senor carrasco that my master would not throw the kingdom he might give me into a sack all in holes for i have felt my own pulse and i find myself sound enough to rule kingdoms and govern islands and i have before now told my master as much take care sancho said samson honours change manners and perhaps when you find yourself a governor you won't know the mother that bore you that may hold good of those that are born in the ditches said sancho but not of those who have the fat of an old christian four fingers deep on their souls as i have nay only look at my disposition is that likely to show ingratitude to any one god grant it said don quixote we shall see when the government comes and i seem to see it already he then begged the bachelor if he were a poet to do him the favour of composing some verses for him conveying the farewell he meant to take of his lady dulcinea del toboso and to see that a letter of her name was placed at the beginning of each line so that at the end of the verses dulcinea del toboso might be read by putting together the first letters the bachelor replied that although he was not one of the famous poets of spain who were they said only three and a half he would not fail to compose the required verses though he saw a great difficulty in the task as the letters which made up the name were seventeen so if he made four ballad stanzas of four lines each there would be a letter over and if he made them of five what they called decimas or redondillas there were three letters short nevertheless he would try to drop a letter as well as he could so that the name dulcinea del toboso might be got into four ballad stanzas 
it must be by some means or other said don quixote for unless the name stands there plain and manifest no woman would believe the verses were made for her they agreed upon this and that the departure should take place in three days from that time don quixote charged the bachelor to keep it a secret especially from the curate and master nicholas and from his niece and the housekeeper lest they should prevent the execution of his praiseworthy and valiant purpose carrasco promised all and then took his leave charging don quixote to inform him of his good or evil fortunes whenever he had an opportunity and thus they bade each other farewell and sancho went away to make the necessary preparations for their expedition end of volume two part two chapter four recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter five of the ingenious gentleman don quixote of la mancha by miguel de cervantes Saavedra, translated by john ormsby eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two part two chapter five of the shrewd and droll conversation that passed between sancho panza and his wife teresa panza and other matters worthy of being duly recorded the translator of this history when he comes to write this fifth chapter says that he considers it apocryphal because in it sancho panza speaks in a style unlike that which might have been expected from his limited intelligence and says things so subtle that he does not think it possible he could have conceived them however desirous of doing what his task imposed upon him he was unwilling to leave it untranslated and therefore he went on to say sancho came home in such glee and spirits that his wife noticed his happiness a bow-shot off so much so that it made her ask him what have you got sancho friend that you are so glad to which he replied wife if it were god's will i should be very glad not to be so well pleased as i show myself i don't understand you husband said she and i don't know what you mean by saying you would be glad if it were god's will not to be well pleased for fool as i am i don't know how one can find pleasure in not having it hark ye teresa replied sancho i am glad because i have made up my mind to go back to the service of my master don quixote who means to go out a third time to seek for adventures and i am going with him again for my necessities will have it so and also the hope that cheers me with the thought that i may find another hundred crowns like those we have spent though it makes me sad to have to leave thee and the children and if god would be pleased to let me have my daily bread dry shod and at home without taking me out into the byways and cross-roads and he could do it at small cost by merely willing it it is clear my happiness would be more solid and lasting for the happiness i have is mingled with sorrow at leaving thee so that i was right in saying i would be glad if it were god's will not to be well pleased look here sancho said teresa ever since you joined on to a knight-errant you talk in such a roundabout way that there is no understanding you it is enough that god understands me wife replied sancho for he is the understander of all things that will do but mind sister you must look to dapple carefully for the next three days so that he may be fit to take arms double his feed and see to the pack-saddle and other harness for it is not to a wedding we are bound but to go round the world and play at give and take with giants and dragons and monsters and hear hissings and roarings and bellowings and howlings and even all this would be lavender if we had not to reckon with young gazons and enchanted moors i know well enough husband said teresa the squires errant don't eat their bread for nothing and so i will be always praying to our lord to deliver you speedily from all that hard fortune i can tell you wife said sancho if i did not expect to see myself governor of an island before long i would drop down dead on the spot nay then husband said teresa let the hen live though it be with her pip live and let the devil take all the governments in the world you came out of your mother's womb without a government you have lived until now without a government and when it is god's will you will go or be carried to your grave without a government how many there are in the world who live without a government and continue to live all the same and are reckoned in the number of the people the best sauce in the world is hunger and as the poor are never without that they always eat with a relish but mind sancho if by good luck you should find yourself with some government don't forget me and your children 
remember that sanchico is now full fifteen and it is right he should go to school if his uncle the abbot has a mind to have him trained for the church consider too that your daughter mari sancha will not die of grief if we marry her for i have my suspicions that she is as eager to get a husband as you to get a government and after all a daughter looks better ill married than well whored by my faith replied sancho if god brings me to get any sort of a government i intend wife to make such a high match for mari sancha that there will be no approaching her without calling her my lady nay sancho returned teresa marry her to her equal that is the safest plan for if you put her out of wooden clogs into high-heeled shoes out of her grey flannel petticoat into hoops and silk gowns out of the plain marica and thou into doña so-and-so and my lady the girl won't know where she is and at every turn she will fall into a thousand blunders that will show the thread of her coarse homespun stuff tut you fool said sancho it will be only to practise it for two or three years and then dignity and decorum will fit her as easily as a glove and if not what matter let her be my lady and never mind what happens keep to your own station sancho replied teresa don't try to raise yourself higher and bear in mind the proverb that says wipe the nose of your neighbor's son and take him into your house a fine thing it would be indeed to marry our maria to some great count or grand gentleman who when the humour took him would abuse her and call her clown bread and clodhopper's daughter and spinning wench i have not been bringing up my daughter for that all this time i can tell you husband do you bring home money sancho and leave marrying her to my care there is lope tocho juan tocho's son a stout sturdy young fellow that we know and i can see he does not look sour at the girl and with him one of our own sort she will be well married and we shall have her always under our eyes and be all one family parents and children grandchildren and sons-in-law and the peace and blessing of god will dwell among us so don't you go marrying her in those courts and grand palaces where they won't know what to make of her or she what to make of herself why you idiot and wife for barabbas said sancho what do you mean by trying without why or wherefore to keep me from marrying my daughter to one who will give me grandchildren that we called your lordship look ye teresa i have always heard my elders say that he who does not know how to take advantage of luck when it comes to him has no right to complain if it gives him the go-by and now that it is knocking at our door it will not do to shut it out let us go with the favouring breeze that blows upon us it is this sort of talk and what sancho says lower down that made the translator of the history say he considered this chapter apocryphal don't you see you animal continued sancho that it will be well for me to drop into some profitable government that will lift us out of the mire and marry mari sancha to whom i like and you yourself will find yourself called doña teresa panza and sitting in church on a fine carpet and cushions and draperies in spite and in defiance of all the born ladies of the town no stay as you are growing neither greater nor less like a tapestry figure let us say no more about it for sanchica shall be a countess say what you will are you sure of all you say husband replied teresa well for all that i am afraid this rank of countess for my daughter will be her ruin you do as you like make a duchess or a princess of her but i can tell you it will not be with my will and consent i was always a lover of equality brother and i can't bear to see people give themselves airs without any right they called me teresa at my baptism a plain simple name without any additions or tags or fringes of dons or donas cascajo was my father's name and as i am your wife i am called teresa panza though by right i ought to be called teresa cascajo but kings go where laws like and i am content with this name without having the don put on top of it to make it so heavy that i cannot carry it and i don't want to make people talk about me when they see me go dressed like a countess or a governor's wife for they will say at once see what airs the slut gives herself only yesterday she was always spinning flax and used to go to mass with the tail of her petticoat over her head instead of a mantle and there she goes to-day in a hooped gown with her brooches and airs as if we didn't know her if god keeps me in my seven senses or five or whatever number i have i am not going to bring myself to such a pass go you brother and be a government or an island man and swagger as much as you like for by the soul of my mother neither my daughter nor i are going to stir a step from our village 
a respectable woman should have a broken leg and keep at home and to be busy at something is a virtuous damsel's holiday be off to your adventures along with your don quixote and leave us to our misadventures for god will mend them for us according as we deserve it i don't know i'm sure who fixed the don to him what neither his father nor grandfather ever had i declare thou hast a devil of some sort in thy body said sancho god help thee what a lot of things thou hast strung together one after the other without head or tail what have cascajo and the brooches and the proverbs and the airs to do with what i say look here fool and dolt for so i may call you when you don't understand my words and run away from good fortune if i had said that my daughter was to throw herself down from a tower or go roaming the world as the infanta doña uraca wanted to do you would be right in not giving way to my will but if in an instant in less than the twinkling of an eye i put the don and my lady on her back and take her out of the stubble and place her under a canopy on a dais and on a couch with more velvet cushions than all the almohades of morocco ever had in their family why won't you consent and fall in with my wishes do you know why husband replied teresa because of the proverb that says who covers thee discovers thee at the poor man people only throw a hasty glance on the rich man they fix their eyes and if the said rich man was once on a time poor it is then there is the sneering and the tattle in spite of backbiters and in the streets here they swarm as thick as bees look here teresa said sancho and listen to what i am now going to say to you maybe you never heard it in all your life and i do not give my own notions for what i am about to say are the opinions of his reverence the preacher who preached in this town last lent and who said if i remember rightly that all things present that our eyes behold bring themselves before us and remain and fix themselves on our memory much better and more forcibly than things past these observations which sancho makes here are the other ones on account of which the translator says he regards this chapter as apocryphal inasmuch as they are beyond sancho's capacity whence it arises he continued that when we see any person well dressed and making a figure with rich garments and retinue of servants it seems to lead and impel us perforce to respect him though memory may at the same moment recall to us some lowly condition in which we have seen him but which whether it may have been poverty or low birth being now a thing of the past has no existence while the only thing that has any existence is what we see before us and if this person whom fortune has raised from his original lowly state these were the very words the padre used to his present height of prosperity be well-bred generous courteous to all without seeking to vie with those whose nobility is of ancient date depend upon it teresa no one will remember what he was and every one will respect what he is except indeed the envious from whom no fair fortune is safe i do not understand you husband replied teresa do as you like and don't break my head with any more speechifying and rethory and if you have revolved to do what you say resolved you should say woman said sancho not revolved don't set yourself to wrangle with me husband said teresa i speak as god pleases and don't deal in out-of-the-way phrases and i say if you are bent upon having a government take your son sancho with you and teach him from this time on how to hold a government for sons ought to inherit and learn the trades of their fathers as soon as i have the government said sancho i will send for him by post and i will send thee money of which i shall have no lack for there is never any want of people to lend it to governors when they have not got it and do thou dress him so as to hide what he is and make him look what he is to be you send the money said teresa and i'll dress him up for you as fine as you please then we are agreed that our daughter is to be a countess said sancho the day that i see her a countess replied teresa it will be the same to me as if i was burying her but once more i say do as you please for we women are born to this burden of being obedient to our husbands though they be dogs and with this she began to weep in earnest as if she already saw sanchica dead and buried sancho consoled her by saying that though he must make her a countess he would put it off as long as possible here their conversation came to an end and sancho went back to see don quixote and make arrangements for their departure end of volume two part two chapter five recording by expatriate in bangor maine volume two 
Part Two, Chapter Six, of the Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume Two, Part Two, Chapter Six. Of what took place between Don Quixote and his niece and housekeeper one of the most important chapters in the whole history. While Sancho Panza and his wife Teresa Cascajo held the above irrelevant conversation, Don Quixote's niece and housekeeper were not idle, for by a thousand signs they began to perceive that their uncle and master meant to give them the slip the third time, and once more betake himself to his, for them, ill-errant chivalry. They strove by all the means in their power to divert him from such an unlucky scheme, but it was all preaching in the desert and hammering cold iron. Nevertheless, among many other representations made to him, the housekeeper said to him, In truth, master, if you do not keep still and stay quiet at home, and give over roaming mountains and valleys like a troubled spirit, looking for what they say are called adventures, but what I call misfortunes, I shall have to make complaint to God and the king with loud supplication to send some remedy. To which Don Quixote replied, What answer God will give to your complaints, housekeeper, I know not, nor what his majesty will answer either. I only know that if I were king, I should decline to answer the numberless silly petitions they present every day. For one of the greatest among the many troubles kings have is being obliged to listen to all and answer all, and therefore I should be sorry that any affairs of mine should worry him whereupon the housekeeper said, Tell us, senor, at his majesty's court are there no knights? There are, replied Don Quixote, and plenty of them, and it is right there should be, to set off the dignity of the prince, and for the greater glory of the king's majesty. Then might not your worship, said she, be one of those that, without stirring a step, serve their king and lord in his court? Recollect, my friend, said Don Quixote, all knights cannot be courtiers, nor can all courtiers be knights errant, nor need they be. There must be all sorts in the world, and though we may be all knights, there is a great difference between one and another, for the courtiers, without quitting their chambers or the threshold of the court, range the world over by looking at a map, without its costing them a farthing, and without suffering heat or cold, hunger or thirst. But we, the true knights errant, measure the whole earth with our own feet, exposed to the sun, to the cold, to the air, to the inclemencies of heaven, by day and night, on foot and on horseback. Nor do we only know enemies in pictures, but in their own real shapes. And at all risks and on all occasions we attack them, without any regard to childish points or rules of single combat, whether one has or has not a shorter lance or sword, whether one carries relics or any secret contrivance about him, whether or not the sun is to be divided and portioned out, and other niceties of the sort that are observed in set combats of man to man, that you know nothing about, but I do. And you must know besides that the true knight-errant, though he may see ten giants, that not only touch the clouds with their heads but pierce them, and that go each of them on two tall towers by way of legs, and whose arms are like the masts of mighty ships, and each eye like a great mill-wheel and glowing brighter than a glass furnace, must not on any account be dismayed by them. On the contrary, he must attack and fall upon them with a gallant bearing and a fearless heart, and if possible, vanquish and destroy them, even though they have for armor the shells of a certain fish that they say are harder than diamonds, and in place of swords wield trenchant blades of Damascus steel, or clubs studded with spikes also of steel, such as I have more than once seen. All this I say, housekeeper, that you may see the difference there is between the one sort of knight and the other. And it would be well if there were no prince who did not set a higher value on this second, or more properly speaking, first kind of knights errant. For, as we read in their histories, there have been some among them who have been the salvation not merely of one kingdom, but of many. Ah, senor, here exclaimed the niece, Remember that all this you are saying about knights-errant is fable and fiction, and their histories, if indeed they were not burned, would deserve each of them to have a San Benito put on it, or some mark by which it might be known as infamous, and a corrupter of good manners. By the God that gives me life, said Don Quixote, if thou wert not my full niece, being daughter of my own sister, 
i would inflict a chastisement upon thee for the blasphemy thou hast uttered that all the world should ring with what can it be that a young hussy that hardly knows how to handle a dozen laced bobbins dares to wag her tongue and criticise the histories of knights errant what would senor amadis say if he heard of such a thing he however no doubt would forgive thee for he was the most humble-minded and courteous knight of his time and moreover a great protector of damsels but some there are that might have heard thee and it would not have been well for thee in that case for they are not all courteous or mannerly some are ill-conditioned scoundrels nor is it every one that calls himself a gentleman that is so in all respects some are gold others pinchback and all look like gentlemen but not all can stand the touchstone of truth there are men of low rank who strain themselves to bursting to pass for gentlemen and high gentlemen who one would fancy were dying to pass for men of low rank the former raised themselves by their ambition or by their virtues the latter debased themselves by their lack of spirit or by their vices and one has need of experience and discernment to distinguish these two kinds of gentlemen so much alike in name and so different in conduct god bless me said the niece that you should know so much uncle enough if need be to get up into a pulpit and go preach in the streets and yet that you should fall into a delusion so great and a folly so manifest as to try to make yourself out vigorous when you are old strong when you are sickly able to put straight what is crooked when you yourself are bent by age and above all a caballero when you are not one for though gentlefolk may be so poor men are nothing of the kind there is a great deal of truth in what you say niece returned don quixote and i could tell you somewhat about birth that would astonish you but not to mix up things human and divine i refrain look you my dears all the lineages in the world attend to what i am saying can be reduced to four sorts which are these those that had humble beginnings and went on spreading and extending themselves until they attained surpassing greatness those that had great beginnings and maintained them and still maintain and uphold the greatness of their origin those again that from a great beginning have ended in a point like a pyramid having reduced and lessened their original greatness till it has come to naught like the point of a pyramid which relatively to its base or foundation is nothing and then there are those and it is they that are the most numerous that have had neither an illustrious beginning nor a remarkable mid-course and so will have an end without a name like an ordinary plebeian lion of the first those that had an humble origin and rose to the greatness they still preserve the ottoman house may serve as an example which from an humble and lowly shepherd its founder has reached the height at which we now see it for examples of the second sort of lineage that began with greatness and maintains it still without adding to it there are the many princes who have inherited the dignity and maintain themselves in their inheritance without increasing or diminishing it keeping peacefully within the limits of their states of those that began great and ended in a point there are thousands of examples for all the pharaohs and ptolemies of egypt the caesars of rome and the whole herd if i may apply such a word to them of countless princes monarchs lords medes assyrians persians greeks and barbarians all these lineages and lordships have ended in a point and come to nothing they themselves as well as their founders for it would be impossible now to find one of their descendants and even should we find one it would be in some lowly and humble condition of plebeian lineages i have nothing to say save that they merely serve to swell the number of those that live without any eminence to entitle them to any fame or praise beyond this from all i have said i would have you gather my poor innocence that great is the confusion among lineages and that only those are seen to be great and illustrious that show themselves so by the virtue wealth and generosity of their possessors i have said virtue wealth and generosity because a great man who is vicious will be a great example of vice and a rich man who is not generous will be merely a miserly beggar for the possessor of wealth is not made happy by possessing it but by spending it and not by spending as he pleases but by knowing how to spend it well the poor gentleman has no way of showing that he is a gentleman but by virtue by being affable well-bred courteous gentle-mannered and kindly not haughty arrogant or censorious but above all by being charitable for by two maravedis given with a cheerful heart to the poor he will show himself as generous as he who distributes alms with bell-ringing 
and no one that perceives him to be endowed with the virtues I have named, even though he know him not, will fail to recognize and set him down as one of good blood. And it would be strange were it not so. Praise has ever been the reward of virtue, and those who are virtuous cannot fail to receive commendation. There are two roads, my daughters, by which men may reach wealth and honors. One is that of letters, the other that of arms. I have more of arms than of letters in my composition, and judging by my inclination to arms, was born under the influence of the planet Mars. I am therefore in a measure constrained to follow that road, and by it I must travel in spite of all the world, and it will be labor in vain for you to urge me to resist what heaven wills, fate ordains, reason requires, and, above all, my own inclination favors. For knowing as I do the countless toils that are the accompaniments of knight-errantry, I know, too, the infinite blessings that are attained by it. I know that the path of virtue is very narrow, and the road of vice broad and spacious. I know their ends and goals are different, for the broad and easy road of vice ends in death, and the narrow and toilsome one of virtue in life, and not transitory life, but in that which has no end. I know, as our great Castilian poet says, that it is by rugged paths like these they go that scale the heights of immortality, unreached by those that falter here below. Woe is me, exclaimed the niece. My lord is a poet, too. He knows everything, and he can do everything. I will bet if he chose to turn mason, he could make a house as easily as a cage. I can tell you, niece, replied Don Quixote, if these chivalrous thoughts did not engage all my faculties, there would be nothing that I could not do, nor any sort of knick-knack that would not come from my hands, particularly cages and toothpicks. At this moment there came a knocking at the door, and when they asked who was there, Sancho Panza made answer that it was he. The instant the housekeeper knew who it was, she ran to hide herself so as not to see him. In such abhorrence did she hold him. The niece let him in, and his master Don Quixote came forward to receive him with open arms, and the pair shut themselves up in his room, where they had another conversation not inferior to the previous one. End of Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 6 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Volume 2, Part 2, Chapter 7 of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety five. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Volume two, Part two, Chapter seven. Of what passed between Don Quixote and his squire, together with other very notable incidents. The instant the housekeeper saw Sancho Panza shut himself in with her master, she guessed what they were about, and suspecting that the result of the consultation would be a resolve to undertake a third sally, she seized her mantle, and in deep anxiety and distress ran to find the bachelor Samson Carrasco, as she thought that being a well-spoken man and a new friend of her master's, he might be able to persuade him to give up any such crazy notion. She found him pacing the patio of his house and perspiring and flurried she fell at his feet the moment she saw him carrasco seeing how distressed and overcome she was said to her what is this mistress housekeeper what has happened to you one would think you heartbroken nothing senor samson said she only that my master is breaking out plainly breaking out whereabouts is he breaking out senora asked samson has any part of his body burst he is only breaking out at the door of his madness she replied I mean, dear Senor Bachelor, that he is going to break out again, and this will be the third time, to hunt all over the world for what he calls ventures, though I can't make out why he gives them that name. The first time he was brought back to us slung across the back of an ass and belabored all over, and the second time he came in an ox cart, shut up in a cage, in which he persuaded himself he was enchanted, and the poor creature was in such a state that the mother that bore him would not have known him lean yellow with his eyes sunk deep in the cells of his skull so that to bring him round again ever so little cost me more than six hundred eggs as god knows and all the world in my hens too that won't let me tell a lie that i can well believe replied the bachelor for
for they are so good and so fat and so well-bred that they would not say one thing for another, though they were to burst for it. In short, then, Mistress Housekeeper, that is all, and there is nothing the matter except what it is feared Don Quixote may do. No, senor, said she. Well, then, returned the bachelor, don't be uneasy, but go home in peace. Get me ready something hot for breakfast, and while you are on the way, say the prayer of Santa Apollonia, that is, if you know it, for I will come presently, and you will see miracles. Woe is me, cried the housekeeper. Is it the prayer of Santa Apollonia you would have me say? That would do if it was the toothache my master had, but it is in the brains what he has got. I know what I am saying, mistress housekeeper. Go, and don't set yourself to argue with me, for you know I am a bachelor of Salamanca, and one can't be more of a bachelor than that, replied Carrasco. And with this the housekeeper retired, and the bachelor went to look for the curate, and arranged with him what will be told in its proper place. While Don Quixote and Sancho were shut up together, they had a discussion which the history records with great precision and scrupulous exactness. Sancho said to his master, Senor, I have educed my wife to let me go with your worship wherever you choose to take me. Induced, you should say, Sancho, said Don Quixote, not educed. Once or twice, as well as I remember, replied Sancho, I have begged of your worship not to mend my words, if so be as you understand what I mean by them. And if you don't understand them to say Sancho or devil, I don't understand thee. And if I don't make my meaning plain, then you may correct me, for I am so fossil. I don't understand thee, Sancho, said Don Quixote at once, for I know not what I am so fossil means. So fossil means I am so much that way, replied Sancho. I understand thee still less now, said Don Quixote. Well, if you can't understand me, said Sancho, I don't know how to put it. I know no more, God help me. Ah! Now I have hit it, said Don Quixote. Thou wouldst say thou art so docile, tractable, and gentle, that thou wilt take what I say to thee, and submit to what I teach thee. I would bet, said Sancho, that from the very first you understood me, and knew what I meant. But you wanted to put me out, that you might hear me make another couple of dozen blunders. Maybe so, replied Don Quixote. But to come to the point, what does Teresa say? Teresa says, replied Sancho, that I should make sure with your worship, and let papers speak and beards be still, for he who binds does not wrangle, since one take is better than two I'll give these, and I say a woman's advice is no great thing, and he who won't take it is a fool. And so say I, said Don Quixote, continue Sancho, my friend, go on, you talk pearls today. The fact is, continued Sancho, that as your worship knows better than I do, we are all of us liable to death, and to-day we are, and to-morrow we are not, and the lamb goes as soon as the sheep, and nobody can promise himself more hours of life in this world than God may be pleased to give him, for death is death, and when it comes to knock at our life's door, it is always urgent, and neither prayers nor struggles nor scepters nor mitres can keep it back, as common talk and report say, and as they tell us from the pulpits every day. All that is very true, said Don Quixote, but I cannot make out what thou art driving at. What I am driving at, said Sancho, is that your worship settle some fixed wages for me, to be paid monthly while I am in your service, and that the same be paid me out of your estate, for I don't care to stand on rewards which either come late or ill or never at all. God help me with my own. In short, I would like to know what I am to get, be it much or little, for the hen will lay on one egg, and many littles make a much, and so long as one gains something there is nothing lost. To be sure, if it should happen, what I neither believe nor expect, that your worship were to give me that island you have promised me, I am not so ungrateful nor so grasping, but that I would be willing to have the revenue of such island valued and stopped out of my wages in due promotion. Sancho, my friend, replied Don Quixote, sometimes proportion may be as good as promotion. I see, said Sancho. I'll bet I ought to have said proportion and not promotion, but it is no matter as your worship has understood me. And so well understood, returned Don Quixote, that I have seen into the depths of thy thoughts, and know the mark thou art shooting at with the countless shafts of thy proverbs. Look here, Sancho, I would readily fix thy wages if I had ever found any instance in the histories of the knights errant to show or indicate by the slightest hint what their squires used to get monthly or yearly. But I have read all or the best part of their histories, and I cannot remember reading of any knight-errant having assigned fixed wages to his squire. 
I only know that they all served on reward, and that when they least expected it, if good luck attended their masters, they found themselves recompensed with an island or something equivalent to it, or at the least they were left with a title and lordship. If with these hopes and additional inducements you, Sancho, please to return to my service, well and good, but to suppose that I am going to disturb or unhinge the ancient usage of knight-errantry is all nonsense. And so, my Sancho, get you back to your house and explain my intentions to your Teresa. And if she likes and you like to be on reward with me, bene quidem. If not, we remain friends. For if the pigeon house does not lack food, it will not lack pigeons. And bear in mind, my son, that a good hope is better than a bad holding, and a good grievance better than a bad compensation. I speak in this way, Sancho, to show you that I can shower down proverbs just as well as yourself. And in short, I mean to say, and I do say, that if you don't like to come on reward with me and run the same chance that I run, God be with you and make a saint of you. For I shall find plenty of squires more obedient and painstaking, and not so thick-headed or talkative as you are. When Sancho heard his master's firm, resolute language, a cloud came over the sky with him and the wings of his heart drooped, for he had made sure that his master would not go without him for all the wealth of the world. And as he stood there dumbfoundered and moody, Samson Carrasco came in with the housekeeper and niece, who were anxious to hear by what arguments he was about to dissuade their master from going to seek adventures. The arch-wag Samson came forward, and embracing him as he had done before, said with a loud voice, O flower of knight-errantry, O shining light of arms, O honor and mirror of the Spanish nation, may God Almighty in his infinite power grant that any person or persons who would impede or hinder thy third sally may find no way out of the labyrinth of their schemes, nor ever accomplish what they most desire. And then, turning to the housekeeper, he said, Mistress housekeeper may just as well give over saying the prayer of Santa Apollonia, for I know it is the positive determination of the spheres that Senor Don Quixote shall proceed to put into execution his new and lofty designs, and I should lay a heavy burden on my conscience did I not urge and persuade this knight not to keep the might of his strong arm and the virtue of his valiant spirit any longer curbed and checked, for by his inactivity he is defrauding the world of the redress of wrongs, of the protection of orphans, of the honor of virgins, of the aid of widows, and of the support of wives, and other matters of this kind appertaining, belonging, proper and peculiar to the order of knight-errantry. On then, my lord Don Quixote, beautiful and brave, let your worship and highness set out today rather than tomorrow, and if anything be needed for the execution of your purpose, here am I ready in person and purse to supply the want and were it requisite to attend your magnificence as squire, I should esteem it the happiest good fortune. At this, Don Quixote, turning to Sancho, said, Did I not tell thee, Sancho, there would be squires enough and to spare for me? See now who offers to become one, no less than the illustrious bachelor Samson Carrasco, the perpetual joy and delight of the courts of the Salamancan schools, sound in body, discreet, patient under heat or cold, hunger or thirst with all the qualifications requisite to make a knight-errant squire. But heaven forbid that to gratify my own inclination I should shake or shatter this pillar of letters and vessel of the sciences, and cut down this towering palm of the fair and liberal arts. Let this new Samson remain in his own country, and, bringing honour to it, bring honour at the same time on the grey heads of his venerable parents. For I will be content with any squire that comes to hand, as Sancho does not deign to accompany me. I do deign, said Sancho, deeply moved and with tears in his eyes. It shall not be said of me, master mine, he continued, the bread eaten and the company dispersed. Nay, I come of no ungrateful stock, for all the world knows, but particularly my own town, who the ponces from whom I am descended were, and what is more I know and have learned by many good words and deeds, your worship's desire to show me favour. And if I had been bargaining more or less about my wages, it was only to please my wife, who, when she sets herself to press a point, no hammer drives the hoops of a cask as she drives one to do what she wants. But, after all, a man must be a man, and a woman a woman. And as I am a man, anyhow, which I can't deny, I will be one in my own house, too, 
let who will take it amiss and so there's nothing more to do but for your worship to make your will with its codicil in such a way that it can't be provoked and let us set out at once to save senor samson's soul from suffering as he says his conscience obliges him to persuade your worship to sally out upon the world a third time so i offer again to serve your worship faithfully and loyally as well and better than all the squires that served knights errant in times past or present the bachelor was filled with amazement when he heard sancho's phraseology and style of talk for though he had read the first part of his master's history he never thought that he could be so droll as he was there described but now hearing him talk of a will and codicil that could not be provoked instead of will and codicil that could not be revoked he believed all he had read of him and set him down as one of the greatest simpletons of modern times and he said to himself that two such lunatics as master and man the world had never seen in fine don quixote and sancho embraced one another and made friends and by the advice and with the approval of the great carrasco who was now their oracle it was arranged that their departure should take place three days thence by which time they could have all that was requisite for the journey ready and procure a closed helmet which don quixote said he must by all means take samson offered him one as he knew a friend of his who had it would not refuse it to him though it was more dingy with rust and mildew than bright and clean like burnished steel the curses which both housekeeper and niece poured out on the bachelor were past counting they tore their hair they clawed their faces and in the style of the hired mourners that were once in fashion they raised a lamentation over the departure of their master and uncle as if it had been his death samson's intention in persuading him to sally forth once more was to do what the history relates farther on all by the advice of the curate and barber with whom he had previously discussed the subject finally then during those three days don quixote and sancho provided themselves with what they considered necessary and sancho having pacified his wife and don quixote his niece and housekeeper at nightfall unseen by any one except the bachelor who thought fit to accompany them half a league out of the village they set out for el toboso don quixote on his good rocinante and sancho on his old dapple his alforjas furnished with certain matters in the way of victuals and his purse with money that don quixote gave him to meet emergencies samson embraced him and entreated him to let him hear of his good or evil fortunes so that he might rejoice over the former or condole with him over the latter as the laws of friendship required don quixote promised him he would do so and samson returned to the village and the other two took the road for the great city of el toboso end of volume two part two chapter seven Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine.